Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Patrick Young. I have to admit, I do have a bit of a fever today, so perhaps this slight typo, victory of death, may be appropriate, actually, on the grounds that good news is I certainly won't speak for more than 20 minutes because I'm not going to be able to stand up for that long. Ladies and gentlemen, what I want to say to you today, regardless of what the message is during the course of the next short period of time, I want you to succeed. The reason I'm saying that is because it's also a disclaimer. In terms of motivating speeches, when you start from the topic of Brexit, it's somewhat difficult to think of this as being an entirely smile-a-minute, laugh-a-minute endeavor in the overall world of discussing what's going on. So, a little introduction about myself. Behind me, you can see a few things. There I am on um, a television channel, which has been occasionally accused of false news, although, curiously enough, they do a lot less manipulation of the news when I'm on than, say, the BBC does, but there's the by the by. I was, amongst other things, a co-founder of a thing called Intrade. That was one of the world's first prediction markets. It's something which is very, very big today, particularly in the Bitcoin and the blockchain economy. I sometimes occasionally have been known to give guest lectures around the world at different universities. I'm a guest lecturer at a thing called the Nicholas Copernicus University, which is in the city of Torun, which was where I lived before I came to this fine island with my beautiful wife, who spoke earlier this afternoon. If you missed it, well, that's more your folly, I have to say. An absolutely fabulous session on the ecosystems of all kinds of issues related to startups, crowdfunding, and so on. We created a startup ecosystem, Mission to Run. It was based in the city called Torun in Poland. And therefore, out of that, we've clearly created various different businesses, mentored various different businesses, and amongst them was actually our own crowdfunding platform, Hansa Trade, that you can see just behind me. The very, very large banner you can see at the bottom, that's a thing called Exchange Invest. If you happen to be fascinated by the machinations of stock markets, of financial market infrastructure the world over, it's free to read. If you happen not to be the sort of person who, between the chairman of the Malta Stock Exchange to the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange, who really read this particular bulletin religiously every day, it may serve as an insomnia cure if you're not particularly interested in exchanges. LiquidNet, that's a business which is the biggest, largest uh, institutional share trading platform in the world, which I used to be a director. And of course, then we come to this little item here. Now, that's something, ladies and gentlemen, called book. Um, I wrote one in 1999. It was long before the Kindle had been invented. Very interesting interface, this, for those of you who are in the digital world. It has a, a sort of single programmable interface in terms of the paper and the way that it's deployed. It's an opportunity, and at that point in time, it was the first book in many ways that talked about a thing that 10 years later we would come to call fintech, ladies and gentlemen. Capital market revolution is a thing that we're still living through. It's the living, existing being of what happens in the world of finance. And the thing is that as everything changes in the world of finance today, well, let's put it this way, ladies and gentlemen. Imagine your life in the palm of your hand. And the truth is, ladies and gentlemen, nowadays in a digital world, our world really is defined by this, microscopically sized telephonic instruments, these incredible things that deliver to our palms all manner of data, trading information, WhatsApp, Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter that Giselle has been doing so assiduously during the course of today for this excellent Finance Malta conference. And incredibly, thanks to the wonders of technology, they've even managed to build telephones into them as well. It's quite incredible what technology can do today. But the thing is, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> this may still be a novelty to us. But today, on the 10th anniversary conference of Finance Malta, a child is born. And that child, ladies and gentlemen, is going to live in a world like no other world we've seen before. It's going to live to be 130 years old. It's going to be a child that, as it goes through education, may barely encounter the paper textbook. It's going to live digital. It's not used to the concept of conventional television. It will download its information from Snapchat, from YouTube, from all of these different sources. The old concept of legacy media is something it simply won't understand. It's going to be in a position where when it reaches 17 or 18 years old, it probably won't even bother this child getting a driving license. Why is that? Because the cars are going to be self-driving. 
ultimately, as they go through life, they are living a digital existence. And that digital existence becomes incredibly important for all of us because it's a way that we can try to understand how fast the world is moving. Because the only thing that is actually constant in this world is change. Whether that's in life, whether that's investment, however you look at it, that is the way our world goes. Equally, the Schumpeterian power of destruction, creative destruction, is greater than it has ever been before. That is driving the world, and the world of this digital child is one where ultimately they're looking to a world entirely different from anything we've seen before. Now, of course, the power to foresee what goes on may not be something that we're especially talented at, ladies and gentlemen, but you know, there were runes towards some of the things that we could see happening in the course of the last year. I'll leave Donald Trump to one side, but of course, this behind us is a slide from a conference, Prosperity UK. It was the first conference really taking GB Inc., trying to reshape the future of post-Brexit Britain. It took place a few weeks ago. Lord Marland was actually one of the speakers as well. I was honored to be invited as a speaker. Someone who was much more famous, much more accomplished, and presumably, probably much richer, was invited but couldn't make it. Therefore, they added me at the last minute. The gentleman here with his hands together is Mr. Jeffrey Sprecher. He runs a business called the Intercontinental Exchange. He's the greatest single entrepreneur in the history of financial market infrastructure. He's the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange. The gentleman on the right is Michael Spencer. Michael Spencer is the most successful self-made man in the city of London. We were discussing financial market infrastructure. I won't go through what went on in that. You can watch the video somewhere else. But I think the most important thing to take away from this at the moment is that for our digital child, they don't look at media in the same way that we do. We're used to particular enfranchisements, franchises of media that have been around for decades and centuries, and they're the places that we trust. They also, ladies and gentlemen, happen to be the media that I believe are thoroughly wrong in terms of what's going on in Brexit. They're embellishing the truth, they're ignoring the truth, and ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, well, let's put it this way. <clears throat> On the 24th of June, the day after the referendum, I made a few phone calls. And I started calling some of these different businesses. And it quickly became apparent the different ways in which businesses are structured in this modern world. So I talked to one particular exchange, and they said, well, yes, we're taking this very seriously. It's very important to do the right thing about Brexit. So therefore, what we've done is we've created a Brexit committee we have co-opted onto it three former MEPs, XYZ people who came from Brussels, and we're going to therefore have a very long review in the committee as to what is going to go on. Now, I'm used on the fact that if these people had been MEPs in Brussels in the first place, and they were British, they may not have entirely been with the will of the British people, and therefore may not be exactly prepared for what was coming in the future. Talk to a number of other businesses, one case, Actually, one case I talked and tried to speak to one of my friends, and they said, I'm terribly sorry, they've just made him head of the Brexit task force. He'll call you back. That was 11 months ago, and I hope he will call me back if he happens to be watching this video in due course. Who knows? It was a huge upheaval. But ultimately, what came from the offices of this man here, Mr. Sprecher? So I phoned up his London office, and I said, look, tell me, what's the word coming down from your headquarters in Atlanta about Brexit. And they said, oh, have you spoken to Jeff? And I said, no, I haven't. I mean, it's 5 o'clock in the morning, Atlanta time. Why would I speak to him? And they said, oh, it's very simple. We already have the word. The word is opportunity. And that, ladies and gentlemen, as far as I'm concerned, is exactly what must define our future approach to everything within the Brexit landscape. There is a possibility that the British Parliament, that the European Union, the European Commission may go for some kind of suicidal, mutually assured destruction in this discussion, but fundamentally, there is an incredible opportunity out there. It's not the opportunity, as the last panel was discussing indeed, that suddenly Canary Wharf is going to empty and we're therefore going to be left with minus 20,000 school places on the island of Malta because they've all come here. But the niche possibilities are there. And fundamentally, what's important, surely what we've learned in the 10 successful years of the Finance Malta Conference under the chairmanship of Kenneth Farooja has been the fact that financial services are not a zero-sum game. Because someone else invents a product, 
doesn't mean that Malta has to lose jobs. Quite the contrary, it's the opportunity for everybody to grow the pie. That makes financial services entirely unlike manufacturing industry, for example. So ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, what are we looking at? Let's just review the simple mega trends, okay? That one, growth, most important slide in the world. The thing that they should tattoo onto the foreheads of students the world over is economic growth. Effectively, all the way through history, until somebody industrializes, we're going nowhere. Everybody's median income is more or less about the level of a beggar in Jabberwocky. Absolutely nothing happening, then it takes off. That trend is intact. The trend is accelerating in a digital world because you look at the efficiency of what they're managing to pack into this wondrous little device here that is your digital life in the palm of your hand, and it's become quite incredible. Disintermediation, the word that we've all come to either love or loathe in the course of the last 20 years in financial services, is absolutely clearly part of the key trend. And that leads us to the peaks that we've seen in terms of what's going on. Peak bank branch. What is important about peak bank branch? Actually, ladies and gentlemen, the biggest threat there is to the high street property owners. Here's a fabulous chart. What we're looking at there, just don't worry about the numbers. It's the lines. It's the trend. What is that? That is, as Americans go online, start deploying their computers, their laptops to go online banking, the number of bank branches collapse. You think that doesn't apply to investor product? Oh, look at this, ladies and gentlemen. Don't worry about the overall numbers. Look at that little blue set of lines going all the way down here. That's a major broker, the number of signups that they're getting by device in the world. That thing at the bottom, you may have heard of it. It's an old-fashioned operating system. It's called Windows. You may also bear in mind that Windows is now the minority operating system in the world, despite having actually spelt out the future of the digital world for the last 20 years. Fascinating times. The opportunity is huge. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, what we have is, in truth, the situation that banker power has peaked. In 2008, it wasn't about the collapse of Lehman's. It wasn't about the movement of items into central counterparty clearing houses, in parentheses, by the way, a business which the Eurozone is not going to be able to steal from London for a multiplicity of reasons, which I just don't have time to talk about. But the truth is, that was the power, the peak, the top of banking. Before we all go home and say, that's the end of banking, bear in mind, Mr. Pacioli, who's the little old chap who's in the picture up there, he was the man who invented double-entry bookkeeping. What we're talking about here is double-entry bookkeeping, powered banking, a 500-year megatrend of banking. That's absolutely huge. It's going to be half the lifetime or longer of our 130-year-old child that was born today. They're probably going to be getting towards their retirement age, which will probably be 100, by the time that we really have seen fundamentally the banking industry severely smaller from where it is at the moment. Equally, it's very important to understand, ladies and gentlemen, the regulatory mindset, the approach we have to technology is absolutely vital. Everybody wants to talk about Uber and Airbnb. Uber, it's interesting, Airbnb, what is happening in the general world of regulation? Taxi regulators are trying to stop them happening in Paris. It frequently occurs that they have an outbreak of their favorite two national sports, rioting and striking. The taxi drivers come out. They don't want to see Uber happening. The regulators come out and ban it. What's the problem with that? The problem with that, ladies and gentlemen, is that the regulators are banning the wrong thing. And that's what we have to look at in the world of the digital child. Because ultimately, we are trying to find a way forward, ladies and gentlemen, that understands not what's coming up in the next five or 10 years. That's Uber. That's now. It's what happens in 20 years, and the difficulty is banning Uber today is a huge problem, because ultimately, taxi drivers won't be around in 20-odd years. They're going to be driverless cars. At the point when we get driverless cars, if we've ended up being constrained by a regulatory system that simply no, makes no sense for us, then we have a huge problem. And ultimately, equally, you always hear this trope in conferences, ladies and gentlemen. People talk about the idea of, wow, you know, it's incredible. Uber, they're a business with no taxis. And, you know, Airbnb, they don't own any hotel rooms. You know why, ladies and gentlemen? They're exchanges. They may not look like and smell like and be regulated in the fashion of the Malta Stock Exchange or the New York Stock Exchange, but that's what they are. They are exchanges, ladies and gentlemen. And that core model, the platform economics of the epicenter of core centralized markets, is a huge aspect of our future. And that's something that spells out some of the hundred opportunities that are in this presentation. When it comes to the distributed ledger, I want you to think about it in this respect. 
when Copernicus was born, when he came along in the city of Torun, where I actually used to work, it was the Copernican revolution, obviously, in the world in terms of heliocentricity. In finance, what he delivered was a Copernican series of papers in the old ways, and he looked at bad money driving out good and so on, as they call it, Gresham's Law and so on. From the perspective of now, the Copernican revolution in finance, well, that's money today. Janet Yellen, head of the Fed, epicenter of the world of money. That's money, maybe not tomorrow, maybe it's not Bitcoin. Bitcoin at the moment, actually this week, has been a minority traded share of the world of cryptocurrency. But the truth is, ladies and gentlemen, the epicenter of what is money, where is money, how it goes, that in the future is going to be something like Bitcoin because it built the infrastructure. Bitcoin has delivered us a whole new infrastructure, the distributed ledger. It's not a panacea. It's not a cure for everything. But that is where we're going to see a huge amount of things moving in the future, which are going to give us a cure. So where are we left, ladies and gentlemen, if we want to preview Finance Malta Conference in 2027? I believe personally, ladies and gentlemen, what we have to do is we have to think back to, well, if you look at my childhood, where were we then? I can remember in my childhood, we used to have imported Chinese toys. They were little plastic things, and they were crap. Okay? Now, where are we at the moment in the finance multi value chain? We are in the early stage of our development still over the course of the next 100 years, the 130 years life of our digital child. Because, ladies and gentlemen, what we're looking at now is we need to move that value chain. We need to provide a better value-added service because the ultimate scaling of simple back office tasks is not going to be the next stage of development for the financial market in the world. That is not going to be the next stage of the development in the Maltese financial center. That that has done a great deal to put Malta on the map, to make Malta seen as a destination for funds and so on. We have a huge opportunity, the possibility to go forward, the possibility to move forward, the possibility to build something that is exciting and interesting for the future. Of course, the trouble with weather forecasting is the fact that, yes, in many ways, it is indeed right too often for us to ignore it and wrong too often for us to rely on it. And in that sense, I'm only a mere student of economics and markets, and I may be highly inaccurate. But what I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, is it's very simple. Out there in the digital world, opportunity is absolutely everywhere. The foible, ladies and gentlemen, is if we do not dare to think bigger, think better, think smarter, think faster, and distribute our thoughts, then ultimately, we have a problem. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why my remarks will end on three simple words. I exhort you to take up the opportunity, because otherwise, the alternative is victory or death. Thank you very much.